On this edition for Sunday, September 6th, a new stimulus bill is expected by week's end. In our signature segment, the practice of gleaning to help feed those in need. And now, here's the fabulous Harry Belafonte. Here he comes. And the extraordinary week that Harry Belafonte hosted The Tonight Show. Next on PBS NewsHour Weekend. PBS NewsHour Weekend is made possible by Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III. The Anderson Family Fund. Bernard and Denise Schwartz. The Cheryl and Philip Milstein family. Barbara Hope Zuckerberg. Charles Rosenblum. We try to live in the moment to not miss what's right in front of us. At Mutual of America, we believe taking care of tomorrow can help you make the most of today. Mutual of America Financial Group. Retirement services and investments. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no-contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional support has been provided by and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin said the Trump administration will try again to introduce a COVID-19 stimulus bill when Congress returns to work on Tuesday. Mnuchin also said today that there is agreement with Democratic leaders on a plan to fund the government through early December to avoid a shutdown. The talks between the White House and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi over a stimulus bill have stalled. Mnuchin and President Trump favor more limited funding, dubbed a skinny bill, while Democratic leaders are pushing for additional stimulus funding for state and local governments and for food and rental assistance. The president and I believe we should do more stimulus. We have about seven and a half million jobs that we need to get back until we're back to where we were. And we want to help small businesses. We want to help uh, businesses that are particularly impacted by this. And we'll continue to work on proposed new legislation. As Congress returns, the race for president will see the candidates from both parties out on the campaign trail in person starting tomorrow. This morning, Democratic vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris said she would not trust a COVID-19 vaccine endorsed only by the president, who has said a vaccine could be ready by Election Day. I would not trust Donald Trump, and it would have to be a credible source of information that talks about the, um, the efficacy and the, and the reliability of whatever he's talking about. I will not take his word for it. He wants us to inject bleach. I, no, I will not take his word. Summer's coming to its unofficial end, but not racial justice demonstrations. The police killing of George Floyd on Memorial Day ignited protests that continue in many places around the country this Labor Day weekend. In Rochester, New York, calls for justice continued last night for the fourth day over the death of Daniel Prude, who died in police custody in March. New York State Attorney General Letitia James said yesterday she's convening a grand jury as part of a, quote, exhaustive investigation into the death of Prude. In Wisconsin, Jacob Blake is speaking out publicly. A Kenosha police officer shot Blake seven times in the back two weeks ago, leading to several days of demands for answers and action, some of those demands which were violent. It's every 24 hours, it's pain, it's number of pain. It hurts to breathe, it hurts to sleep, it hurts to move from side to side, it hurts to eat. Please, I'm telling you, change our lives out there. And in Portland, Oregon, police declared a protest overnight, a riot, and fired tear gas after activists reportedly threw rocks and firebombs at police. At one point, a man's legs caught on fire. Police described the protesters as, quote, engaging in tumultuous and violent conduct and they arrested more than 50 people. In Hong Kong today, police arrested nearly 300 people at protests over the decision to delay local elections. Today was supposed to be election day for the Hong Kong legislature, but Chief Executive Carrie Lam postponed it for one year, citing the pandemic. 
Opponents said she was afraid opposition lawmakers would make electoral gains. Mass protests erupted in this former British colony last year over proposed extradition law, but the coronavirus and a new national security law imposed by China have tamped down on street demonstrations. New cases of the coronavirus continue to be reported around the world today, with the U.S., India, and Brazil still having the highest numbers. As of this morning, Johns Hopkins University reports close to 27 million coronavirus infections worldwide and more than 880,000 deaths from COVID-19. In the United States, the New York Times tracking project shows an average of almost 41,000 new cases per day over the past week. That's a 7% decrease over the past two weeks and a significant drop since late July when the Times database found well more than 60,000 new cases being reported every day. Health officials continue to warn that holiday weekend gatherings and the return of students to college campuses could mean new spikes in infections. They are urging communities to keep social distancing, mask wearing, and hand washing protocols in place. A federal judge has ordered the U.S. Commerce Department to temporarily stop winding down its operations to complete the U.S. Census by the end of this month. In a lawsuit brought by a coalition of cities, counties, and civil rights groups, U.S. District Judge Lucy Coe put a hold on a plan to expedite the census count until a hearing can take place on September 17th. The plaintiffs in this lawsuit, which is one of several across the country, they argue the sped-up timeline will lead to an undercount of minority communities. In a press release, the Census Bureau said it and the Commerce Department are, quote, obligated to comply with the court's order and are taking immediate steps to do so. Californians are sweltering through a heat wave again today as firefighters battle multiple wildfires across the state. Beaches and campgrounds were full with people seeking relief from the heat. Military helicopters airlifted hundreds of people trapped by a wildfire at a California campground near Shaver Lake in the Sierra National Forest late yesterday and again today. Two people were severely injured and the fire quickly spread to more than 56 square miles. Officials have said nearly 12,500 firefighters are battling 22 major fires in the state just this weekend. The heat wave is expected to continue through tomorrow and California's utility companies are asking residents once again to reduce energy use to help avoid rolling blackouts. For more national and international news, visit pbs.org slash newshour. Food insecurity in the United States skyrocketed when the COVID-19 pandemic began almost six months ago. It's left emergency food distributors stretched to provide enough to those in need. To help fill this gap, organizations around the country have doubled down on an age-old practice of getting excess crops from farms to families in need. On the third Friday of every month, St. Mary's Outreach in Newburgh, New York, opens its doors. After a quick COVID symptom screen and mask check, people wind their way around the outside of this gym, following tape on the floor to try to remain six feet apart. They find canned food and staples like rice, but the highlight for many is the more than a dozen different types of fresh produce. I'm so amazed that they have an abundance of vegetables like this. Look at the size of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a great privilege to come here and get this here. And I'm not ashamed of it because I'm going to go home and I'm going to eat very good. Marietta Allen is the director of St. Mary's Outreach. We have a community that's very, very poor and I try to include fresh stuff every, every month makes a big, big difference. And the families are very appreciative too, so it's a good thing. Even before the pandemic, this part of Newburgh, a city 70 miles north of New York City, was categorized as a food desert, according to federal data, meaning there's reduced access to fresh, affordable fruits and vegetables. But at this food bank, much of this produce could just as easily be found at upscale farmers markets in wealthy enclaves of places like New York City. In fact, Less than 48 hours earlier, much of it was. Uh, no, we can do cash for a credit. 
Getting this produce from here to emergency food distributors is the job of a complex regional distribution network that gleans or takes excess food from farmers and gets it to the needy. Gleaning is a custom that dates back thousands of years, even described in the book of Ruth in the Bible. But it's become more challenging during the pandemic, just as demand for emergency food is surging. We've got pink turkey tie-dye. Kevin Smith is the owner of Sycamore Farms, and he brings produce to this New York City green market in Union Square twice a week. It never closed during the COVID-19 shutdown. So this farmer's market, especially this year, has been a great sense of community uh, for myself, the people that shop here, and uh, for products. It's been really a, a saving grace for me and my family. At the end of the day, anything that's not sold is carefully reloaded onto his refrigerated truck and brought back to his 237-acre farm about 70 miles northwest of New York City. Early the next morning, a team from Cornell Cooperative Extension Orange County is sifting through what's left. I'll take some stuff and go into Newburgh. Styles Najak runs Cornell Extension's gleaning program. We uh, move close to 400,000 pounds of food fresh from the farm directly to soup kitchens and food pantries so that they don't have to store it every year. And yeah, we, we move food. <laughs> we move food as quickly as we need to to make sure that it is eaten while fresh. Gleaning Sycamore's market truck means going through produce carefully to make sure only fruits and vegetables that are still good are taken. In the middle of tomato season, it's a time-consuming process. When gleaning, you wind up getting a wide variety of quality. This is amazing. This, this is what you want. You want food that has been grown and cared for and just didn't find a market, a home from the market. We'll give it a good home. All told, nearly 6,000 pounds of produce, including tomatoes, corn, peppers, beans, and eggplants, are taken from Sycamore's truck and loaded onto Cornell Extension's refrigerator truck, ready to be taken to distribution points across the region. This program, which is funded by state and local grants, as well as donations, is one of nearly 200 gleaning programs in North America, according to the Association of Gleaning Organizations. The growth of gleaning programs, like Cornell Extensions, has partly been driven by adding financial incentives for farmers. Since 2018, New York State farms can receive a tax credit of up to $5,000. That's in addition to getting a break on their federal taxes for donating crops to nonprofits. This could be the difference between whether or not, you know, they have a big bill to pay or a small bill to pay at the end of the year. In addition to the tax incentives, Kevin Smith says having a place to donate actually helps him maintain the value of his produce at the green market. We used to do it about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We started having discount sales. We created a culture of late in the day shoppers who were looking only for deals. So when I started working with Styles, I no longer felt the pressure of taking home this extra produce as a burden. I would much rather donate than discount my rates here where I have an established market. For the last decade, Sycamore has donated on average about 65,000 pounds of produce each year. And it's not alone. As the pandemic increases food insecurity, Cornell Extension's gleaning program has been busier than ever. Everybody is growing fresh produce for us to donate. It's been, I would say we've easily doubled the amount of food that we're moving on a weekly basis. But even as donations increase, the pandemic adds new challenges to how Stiles and her team operate. In other years, excess crops like these tomatoes, which were passed over by pickers for not being perfect, might have been collected by volunteers for donation, but not this year. I would like to get volunteers into the field. However, we do have to take into consideration social distancing, masks. This year, COVID has kind of slowed us down in that, in that matter. Back in Newburgh, about 20 miles from Sycamore Farm, gleaned tomatoes, corn, beans, eggplant, nectarines, and peaches are delivered to St. Mary's Outreach. The next morning, volunteers put the produce into grabbable plastic bags before they are distributed to those in need. This food pantry has been here for almost a decade, but this will be its last time operating in this 3,500 square foot gym. Because of COVID-19, a Head Start program for kids needs this space for social distancing. 
With increased demand for emergency food, Marietta Allen says she's looking for a new space. I'm hoping we can find something, but wherever we are, we give away as much as we can. In 1968, America was embroiled in protests over civil rights of the Vietnam War. In that tumultuous time, Tonight Show host Johnny Carson turned over his hosting duties for an entire week to actor and activist Harry Belafonte. Belafonte's guests, mostly African American, included Martin Luther King Jr., Lena Horne, and Bobby Kennedy. It was a week, though, almost lost in history, but now revisited in a documentary called The Sit-In, airing Thursday on NBC's streaming platform, Peacock. I recently spoke with The Sit-In's director, Yoruba Richin, and producer, Joan Walsh. Thank you so much for talking to us about this documentary. I'm just curious, how did this all come to pass in 1968 with Harry Belafonte actually sitting in for Johnny Carson? Well, from what we know, Michael, he, Johnny Carson really cared about these issues. Uh, we don't think of him as a political person, uh, but he had a lot of concern about race relations. He was a little bit ahead of his time, partly because he was in the entertainment business. Uh, you know, he was close to Harry. Uh, and he wanted to turn the show over so that Harry could showcase his view of the world for a full week. Uh, and he got back up from, from NBC ex executives also, which was pretty amazing, as you said, given the time. I also think um, Harry was such a huge star uh, at that time. And it's, it's, we sometimes don't remember, uh, you know, he was multi-platform TV, film, uh, movies. And I think that Johnny thought he was the guy, literally, he was the guy who could do it, who could speak to a national audience um, about these these issues and be entertaining. Because of what Harry was already doing. I mean, some of the film goes into what Harry was doing in the 1950s and, and on stage with uh, diverse uh, cast members and so forth. So I, I guess to a certain extent that made it, quote, more acceptable to uh, uh, um, America's audience? Yeah, I mean, I think Harry was a huge super, uh, a superstar for everyone, black, white, uh, you know, and we say in the film, it's pretty amazing for him to be appealing to white audiences during these times of segregation. There are only a few, very few who did that. I think of Sammy Davis Jr. Um, and, and Harry. I would imagine that the network executives still, though, were nervous about the content of what he was going to talk about, because after all, Belafonte was not a comedian. Part of his negotiation, he was very, very, uh, he's very humble in, the, in, in, our, in our documentary as well. He says, I wasn't really, I didn't think I was ready to take Johnny Carson's chair, and I don't tell jokes, and, you know, I'm just not that guy. Uh, so he also negotiated that he would sing a song each night instead of doing a, a stand-up kind of monologue. And that was the accommodation they made with his type of stardom. It was astounding to see uh, uh, the caliber of people who were on this show, just the two uh, that were uh, recorded as far as we can tell. And it was astounding. I mean, you had uh, Dr. King sitting next to Paul Newman, sitting next to Leon Bibb, sitting next to Nipsey Russell. I mean, it's just, You'd, it's you'd never, amazing to see. You'd never see it anywhere else. I think it shows his uh, reach, right? His reach into the political world and into the entertainment world. You know, it's one of those people, it's like, you know, the one for the ages where people are, want to be around him. People, uh, his intelligence, his, his talent, um, his commitment, his, uh, his um, loyalty is I think is what got all those people together to have that kind of lineup uh, that week. When you started on this, on this journey with this documentary, I'm just curious for both of you, what astounded you about, about this week of hosting the Johnny Carson Tonight Show for Harry Belafonte? What, is, what astounded you? The diversity of his guests, the quality of his guests, the way that he uh, 
the way that he handled himself as an interviewer, which is, you know, it, it's not, it's not that easy. You know, it can, it can, if it looks easy, you're doing a good job because it's really not easy. Uh, and so he stepped into that role so seamlessly and also brought both humor and, and, and commitment. So those were, those were some of the main things. Yeah. I mean, the fact that, uh, I didn't know about it. I mean, when Joan uh, and the producers approached, approached me about directing the film, I was immediately interested because I didn't know about it. But also the fact that it wasn't until many years later, till Arsenio Hall, that we have not had another host. Um, I mean, Harry was host for just that week. He was the first African-American host of that week. And then, you know, a long dry period until we had a, another African American host of uh, of late night, and and we still have a problem there around around diversity in late night. So that's also astounding. All right. Uh, I want to play a clip, and the clip has to do with Harry Belafonte going back to the Tonight Show within a month or so uh, of him hosting the show. You, did you have a ball with it? I caught you a couple of nights. Looks like you're having a great time. I had a marvelous time, the grooviest time in the world here. The week that I spent here. We ended with ratings that were larger than the ones we opened with. And we opened with the largest numbers in the history of the show. And he also talks about, um, I think the, the documentary shows, the list of guests that he had on, and phenomenal. And then he talks about, thank you for the sit-in, which is just, I mean, <laughs> uh, unless you know history, there's so many people who, who may not catch that. I mean, this was uh, Harry Belafonte, uh, then, now, whenever, awfully clever entertainment. Very, very clever. I mean, we, we found out about that, that he called it the sit-in uh, semi-late in the process. Someone reached out to me who happened to be uh, Johnny Carson's secretary at, in, in that time period. Uh, and she was so excited that, the, you know, that the week was being written about. And she sent me a copy. He, he took out a full page ad in Variety, uh, thanking not only all of his guests, uh, but also the staffers um, on The Tonight Show who, who helped. But at the top, he says, you know, thanks to all of you who joined me at this sit-in, you know, and a sit-in is not a neutral term in, at that point. You know, the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement, in some ways it started with, well, Rosa Parks sitting in, but also the students sitting in at, at lunch counters, you know, uh, college students sitting in uh, around the Vietnam War. So it wasn't just a, you know, like a funny throw off line. It just show, it showed that he saw what he did in a, in a friendly way as a, as a political act, not just a, you know, well, we had a great week and we got great ratings. Yeah, it's a brilliant uh, uh, move to call to call it a sit-in, uh, which of course is our title of our film. Um, and uh, you know, not that we were the brilliant ones. Harry was the brilliant one to to do it and to bring that kind of po politics again to a mainstream in Variety in uh, right. on the Tonight Show. Um, you know, and that's sort of the history. You know, so much of his of his work that he was doing, bringing those. Uh, politics for some radical into the mainstream. It's a it's a terrific film. I hope a lot of people get a chance to see it. It's called The Sit-In, just as Harry Belafonte penned it way back in 1968. And we're talking to the director, Yoruba Richard, and we're talking to the producer, of course, Joan Walsh. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank, Thank you so much for having us. Finally tonight, it's over before the finals for Novak Djokovic, the number one men's tennis player and number one seed in the U.S. Open. Djokovic was disqualified from the tournament this afternoon after inadvertently striking a lineswoman with the ball he hit in frustration. After losing the first set, Djokovic pulled the ball from his pocket and smacked it with his racket toward the back of the court. It hit the lineswoman in the throat. She fell to the ground but was able to walk away shortly thereafter. After discussion, the referee defaulted Djokovic, making the winner 20th seed Pablo Carrena Busta from Spain, who now advances to the quarterfinals. That's all for this edition of PBS NewsHour Weekend. For the latest news updates, visit pbs.org slash newshour. I'm Michael Hill. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy and have a good night.
PBS NewsHour Weekend is made possible by Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, The Anderson Family Fund, Bernard and Denise Schwartz, The Cheryl and Philip Milstein Family, Barbara Hope Zuckerberg, Charles Rosenblum. We try to live in the moment to not miss what's right in front of us. At Mutual of America, we believe taking care of tomorrow can help you make the most of today. Mutual of America Financial Group, retirement services and investments. Additional support has been provided by Consumer Cellular and by and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.